Thank you. And I see that folks are still streaming in. So welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us for our webinar today. Um, how electronic health records or EHRs can be leveraged to streamline social needs screening. Um, we're getting started right at the top of the hour, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and today's webinar is uh, presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council in partnership with our great friends at High Tech or the Health Information Technology Evaluation and Quality Center. Um, we're really glad that everyone has joined us today for a great conversation around social needs screening. Um, and today's presentation will be recorded, just a heads up. We, um, in the coming days or weeks, we'll be uploading the material online for future um, training opportunities. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, just a quick acknowledgement that um, today's webinar is supported by HRSA and that any of the contents uh, presented by us or high tech or anybody on the call today um, don't necessarily represent the views of HRSA. And if you want any more information, go to hrsa.gov for more. As I mentioned, um, today's presentation is uh, presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and high tech um, on the council side of things. Um, we have myself, I'm Joseph Kinkel. I'm the research and data manager with the council and my colleague, uh, Chad Hunter, who is the epidemiology research manager. We are excited to kick things off at the kind of get go here and make sure that everyone's welcomed and um, that we've set a little bit of context for our conversation before kicking it over to our friends, Molly and Natalie at high tech. And it will give them an opportunity to introduce themselves in a couple of minutes once we start there their portion. We also have uh, some wonderful guests from Atlanta, Georgia, who we will uh, introduce in a little bit from Mercy Care, a federally qualified health center over there in Atlanta, who have graciously uh, joined us to share what they've learned in their community and in the types of, of work that they're doing over there. Um, but for now, let's get started uh, with some learning objectives. So um, the hope for today is that attendees, you all of this webinar will describe the importance of capturing social needs screening data and how they relate to the overall health center services, that you'll appraise your organization's social needs screening workflow based on promising practices and examples from a peer health center. You'll describe strategies that can be applied to your health center to improve or streamline social needs screening processes. And finally, that you'll identify which strategies demonstrated in the webinar can be introduced at your organization. And to achieve those objectives, our roadmap looks like this. Um, Chad and I, um, from the council side of things, will introduce and do just a couple minutes of level setting, really high level, before kicking it over to high tech for their presentation. And following that, we will have a Q&A and conversation with, as I mentioned, Mercy Care from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm really excited to, to have that conversation and also an opportunity for you all to ask questions of them. Following that, we wanna make sure that today is really uh, useful to you all in your individual context. We know a lot of people are coming from, from different types of organizations, different types of health centers that are at different stages of work. So we are gonna have some breakout discussions at the end for about 10 minutes to um, give us an opportunity to see what we can take away from today's conversation and, and bring home um, to our individual contexts. So we're really excited um, to get started. Let's jump into our level setting then. Um, and so was, we, we like to start and, you know, we're preaching to the choir with a audience that's um, primarily health centers and, and healthcare providers. Um, but when we have conversations around data and social needs data, and different types of, of, of workflows. We like to make sure that we ground our conversation in the um, broader conditions that influence health and health outcomes at our organizations and to really acknowledge initially the impact that the social determinants of health, including healthcare access, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, economic stability and economic access, or rather education access and quality that these determinants have on all of the consumers at our health centers and organizations, and that many of the consumers at your organization are likely experiencing um, different types of social needs 
that are related to any or all of the social determinants at once. And so it isn't our goal today to really prescribe solutions for broader systemic issues, but to rather focus in on um, aiding how we can broaden our conversation and understand the immediate needs related to these broader conditions. And so let's talk a little bit about um, specifically homelessness as a social determinant of health, because as the Healthcare for the Homeless um, Council, you know, that's our kind of primary focus is on homelessness and how it intersects with healthcare. And we know that a lot of you all on the call today are serving um, either primarily or at least a, a good chunk of the clients and consumers at your health centers are experiencing homelessness. And homelessness itself is a social determinant of health. We know people who are homeless have higher rates of illness and die on average 12 years sooner than the general population. And that the inner relationship between homelessness and health outcomes is a rather complex one. We know that homelessness itself can cause um, poor health outcomes, but that also on the flip side of the coin, poor health outcomes can be a driver and and cause of homelessness itself. And so, you know, regardless of what the cause is, we just know that homelessness itself and the lack of housing really sabotages everything uh, around medical care. And so this quote at the bottom of the screen, everything we do with medical care is sabotaged by the lack of housing, comes from multiple conversations that we've had, um, listening sessions that we've had with healthcare for the homeless providers, when um, it comes to the, you know, the conversation of social determinants of health, that um, these things are, are really complex and, and interrelated in a, in a really specific way. Um, so that's from a really broad level, and I'm going to kick it over to my colleague Chad to talk a little bit more, provide some context around social needs data in HCHs. Thanks for that, Joey. Hi, everyone. My, like Joey said, my name is Chad Hunter. I'm the Epidemiology Research Manager with the Council. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the uh, data when it comes to social determinants of health. So what is the health center's role with, in screening for non-health factors? So ACH programs play a crucial role in screening for non-health factors, um, also known as social determinants of health among the people or individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, some of those roles that HCH programs can undertake um, co are comprehensive assessments. Um, HCH programs often conduct comprehensive assessments of individuals experiencing homelessness to identify their medical, behavioral health, and social needs. Um, this includes screening for non-health factors such as housing instability, food insecurity, substance use, mental health issues, and access to social support networks. Um, HCH programs often collaborate with community-based organizations, social service agencies, and other stakeholders to address social determinants of health affecting individuals' experience of homelessness. This may involve referring clients to external resources and services such as housing assistance programs, food pantries, employment services, and legal aid organizations. Are you go to the next slide, Joey. Um, some benefits of collecting social needs data um, a few of them are, are listed here, but a few others are targeted interventions. Um, by collecting data on social needs, such as housing instability and food insecurity, uh, organizations can better understand the specific needs of their clients and patients. This allows for the development of targeted interventions and services to address those, those needs more effectively. Um, it can also improve care coordination Social needs data can facilitate better coordination of care among health care providers, social workers, and other service providers. Um, and by sharing information about patient social needs, uh, care can collaborate more effectively to address those needs and provide more comprehensive care. You go to the next slide, Joey. So some benefits of provider training. Um, healthcare professionals and students, including social workers, nurses, advanced practice providers and physicians generally believe that screening for social needs was acceptable within their scope of practice. Um, in the real world setting though, um, providers reported that social screening strengthened or had no negative impact on patient provider relationships. And there are a few studies that include frontline staff, though they, they were often tasked with administering social screening. Uh, go to the next slide, Joey. 
Great. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate that. Um, so with a little bit of context having been set, we're going to kick it over to Molly and Natalie uh, from High Tech to begin their portion. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Natalie Truesdell from the High Tech Center, and I'm excited to be here with our colleagues um, to talk about social needs screening. Um, I see some familiar names in the audience and lots of new names. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with the High Tech Center, if you go to the next slide there, um, we are uh, one of the National Training and Technical Assistance Partners funded by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. And our focus is to support health centers and how they become data-driven and equitable by providing training and technical assistance and resources on the use of data and IT and EHRs. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today is the use of EHRs in social needs screening. Um, this is one event of many that we host. Um, we also have a national website and uh, provide training and support through our learning collaboratives and virtual trainings, as well as some on-demand technical assistance. Um, if you haven't been part of our events in the, before, you can see on the right, we cover a number of other related topics. Um, today, we're talking about how you use um, HIT to support, support improve clinical quality and health equity. But we also talk about privacy and security, advancing interoperability, and many other topics. Um, so myself um, and my colleague, Molly, here are both from JSI. We also partner with Westat to offer these kinds of events. So thank you for being with us here today. Um, next slide. So we'd love to just um, get to know who's with us today. If you wouldn't mind adding to the chat um, your city and state and where you're joining us from and your primary role um, at the health center. And that will help us to have a little bit two-way dialogue. We will be having time for conversation, as Joseph said at the beginning. So we look forward to um, talking with you after um, sharing some presentation here and um, hearing from our panelists. So with that, I'll pass it to you, Molly. Awesome. Thanks, Natalie. And thanks, everyone, for sending those responses in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on them. Um, all right. So as you send those in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so today we're talking about social needs screening program maturity. In 2021, we conducted interviews with 11 health centers who successfully reported SDOH on their UDS in 2020. And we've since connected with many others. So based on our conversations with health centers, we observed four levels of maturity in the social screening tool implementation process. We developed a report on these levels that Natalie will send in the chat now. And today we'll be talking about levels one and two, which you can see here. They include coming to consensus and implementing a social needs screening tool. How health centers learn and apply the information I'll be sharing today will depend on your unique settings and your level of readiness. So I know you all are still um, give, sending in your location and your role and your name, um, but when you're ready, tell us in the chat what, motiv what motivated you to join this webinar today? And I'll give you all a few minutes to answer that. Okay, so I'm seeing Rachel just transitioned to a new EHR. Candace has SDOH as an HCC and objective, wanting to learn new things, ideas on how we can do better, looking to improve our efforts. Yeah, and keep sending those. I think with this question, we just sort of wanted to get at that, you know, there's all sorts of reasons that health centers want to start implementing a social needs screening program, or a lot of you may already have a social needs program in place, but you're looking to adapt or change things about it. Um, and so hopefully this webinar today will, will address the needs um, of all of you, no matter how different the needs are. So um, go ahead and keep sending answers in the chat, but I'm going to start to talk about the first level of social needs screening program maturity, which is coming to consensus. So one piece related to creating consensus is identifying the why of social needs screening, which some of you are doing in the chat now. So your team can come together and discuss, in our clinic, why is this information collected? What will we do with it? 
Your team can also work to identify what your primary goal for social needs screening is. For example, are you aiming to screen every patient or only higher risk patients, or maybe patients of certain ages, such as only adults, adolescents, or peds? Some health centers have shared with us that, it, that they decided to focus on the social needs that they felt they had the most opportunity to influence internally, such as health literacy or providing clothing. Others have shared that the primary goal of their social needs screening is to identify patient needs across the board to drive the community partnerships that they should form, or to identify high-risk patients for care management, or to demonstrate the complexity of their patients. I've highlighted some other drivers behind social needs screening programs on this slide. These drivers can be both external and internal to your organization. One common driver is alignment with the patient-centered medical home. PCMH recognition sometimes brings with it financial incentives, which were highlighted by health centers as a motivator for adopting a social needs screening program. Other financial opportunities include ACO and Medicaid MCO incentives. Value-based care priorities, such as leveraging data for risk scoring and care management, were another driver for adopting a social needs screening program. Health centers saw implementing a robust social needs screening program as an opportunity to advance these data-driven approaches. Other health centers have voiced that additional grant funding, combined with eager and motivated staff, helped them to take the next step. As many of you know, it is often a combination of these motivations that support health centers in starting out. In addition to these drivers, health centers identified other factors that were key to implementing social needs screening programs. One important factor is the forming of an integrated care team. Many health centers formed an interdisciplinary team made up of leadership, IT staff, social workers, medical providers, and billing staff to make high level decisions on how to integrate social needs screening into clinic workflows. The unique perspective of each of these roles is critical to creating a robust and sustainable screening program. Securing leadership buy-in is also critical to the success and sustainability of health center screening programs. We've developed a resource that contains strategies for securing buy-in from both leadership and staff that Natalie will chat out now. As I mentioned earlier, one approach that health centers use to secure buy-in is to highlight the financial opportunities related to screening and responding to social needs data, including alignment with ACO, MCO, or other value-based care priorities. Another approach that teams use to come to consensus is to pilot their social needs screening program by anonymous, anonymously collecting social need data from randomly selected patients. Conducting this type of trial run can be helpful in determining the health center's capacity to meet the volume of social needs or if further tools and supports are needed. Undergoing a pilot will help health center leadership to make an informed and intentional decision. Health centers primarily collect and address social needs screening data outside of the medical encounter. Therefore, securing buy-in from staff such as nurses, MAs, care coordinators, behavioral health coordinators, and case managers is just as critical as securing buy-in from leadership. In order to address staff hesitations about the new process, health centers started small and piloted screening programs to address any bottlenecks and ensure that once staff were asked to collect and enter data, they didn't receive discouraging error messages in the EHR or experience system malfunctions. When developing your social needs screening workflow, take time to consider how the workflow can be structured so that the burden of the work is evenly distributed and doesn't significantly increase the workload of any certain team members. For example, one health center has their CHW administer the screening and do a warm handoff with the provider in which they summarize the needs identified and the resources provided so that the provider knows what has been taken off of their plate. Since screening tools like Prepare include what can feel like an overwhelming number of questions, many of the health centers we spoke with scaled back the number of questions they asked and ultimately included the questions that were more actionable or required for reporting purposes. Health centers also find it helpful to identify staff champions who are already excited about social needs screening to take a lead role in implementation. Another helpful strategy is to share success stories about what happened as a result of social needs screenings. These success stories can be shared at staff meetings to build excitement and buy-in about the process. 
We have found that the process of building a social needs screening program mirrors other change processes that you all may be familiar with, such as implementing the PHQ-9 or the SBIRT. In implementing these screening programs, health centers choose between screening tools, consider how and where to capture resources in the EHR, determine what will be done with positive screens, and figure out how to close the referral loop. Implementing social needs screening requires similar decision-making, workflow changes, and related considerations. So it can be helpful to look back on how you implemented workflows for PHQ-9 or SBIRT or other screenings when you're growing your social needs screening program. All right, so level two is all about leveraging health IT to establish a streamlined social needs screening workflow. Health centers examined their EHR and workflows to determine how best to capture individual level social needs data. Capturing this information in the EHR assists with standardizing data collection, which in turn supports patient-centered care by informing care plans and identifying patient needs that may be addressed through care management. More recent research suggests that integrating social needs data in the EHR also supports risk assessment, as well as predicting utilization and health outcomes. When building out your social needs screening workflow, it is important to identify what processes will align well with what is already built into your specific EHR. It is possible to develop your own social needs screening tool by building structured data fields in the EHR. However, these self-program fields can make it challenging to evaluate the data collected. Many health centers have opted to use vendor program forms or other existing templates that are available in their EHR instead of self-programming their own fields. This is because vendor programmed forms simplify the data collection process and reduce staff burden by offering standardized response options that make data maintenance on the back end much easier. Vendor programmed forms also allow users to pull patient information from other places in the EHR, which can reduce redundancy and simplify the screening process for staff. You may need to contact your EHR vendor or review what is currently available in your vendor's library to enable the use of these forms. Health centers also had to determine where in the EHR to capture social needs data. It can be helpful to select a location in the EHR that providers already use to capture data, such as the patient's social history, demographics, progress notes, or in their care plan. It's also important to determine when during the patient visit the screening will take place and who will conduct it. We developed a resource that outlines the pros and cons of different strategies for collecting social needs data that Natalie will chat out now. Different methods include in-person staff conducted screenings, often in the exam room before meeting with the provider, pre-visit calls conducted by staff, oftentimes MAs who enter information directly into the EHR, paper screeners, distributed during check-in that staff then manually record in the EHR, kiosks or tablets distributed during check-in and through the patient portal as part of the pre-visit check-in. As I mentioned earlier, it can be helpful to examine the processes your health center uses to identify patients in need of other screenings like PHQ-9s or cancer screenings. It can also be helpful to offer the tool in different ways, for example, allowing patients to do a pre-visit online screening or an in-person screening because different patients may feel more comfortable or give more honest answers with different methods. Let's pause with a quick poll, which I'll have Joseph send out now. Please answer the question that pops up on your screen. I'll give you all a few minutes to do so. All right, I'll give you all about 10 more seconds. Looks like we're getting a lot of responses. All right, let's close out the poll and look at the results. Okay, so the question was, how does your health center conduct SDOH screenings? The biggest answer by far was in-person staff conducted screenings. 
Next highest was paper screenings during check-in, then kiosks or tablets distributed during check-in, and then lastly, pre-visit calls conducted by staff. Interestingly, no one said through the patient portal. Thanks, everyone. So your team should decide which social needs screening workflow makes sense in the context of your organization. When deciding which method your staff should use to collect social needs data, your team should discuss the key considerations listed on this slide. One important point to consider when deciding on a method is that patients with low health, technology, or language literacy may be better positioned to complete screenings with the support of health center staff in person or over the phone so that staff can better translate and explain questions posted. Another point to consider is that patients without smartphones or who have limited broadband internet or technology accessibility will have greater challenges completing pre-visit screenings administered through the patient portals or links set via text or email. Additionally, it can be challenging to get patients into the health center, which makes it critical that health centers capture and address a patient's social needs within the same visit. Make sure the method you choose ensures that social needs screening information be entered into the EHR in as near to real time as possible so that the patient can be conducted with the necessary resources and referrals. Finally, IT functions that automatically pull in needed social need data from other places within the EHR, such as demographics, reduce burden on staff, and reduce duplicate questions for the patient, simplifying the screening process overall. Finally, health centers had to determine how often to collect social, patients' social needs data. We've developed a resource on strategies for determining the frequency of social needs screening that Natalie will chat about now. Your team can consider what makes most sense clinically, as well as consider the burden that screenings place on care teams. Across the board, health centers have told us that limiting the number of additional screening questions, somewhere between four to 15, is most manageable for both staff and patients. All right, we'll do another quick poll, which Joseph can send out now. So please answer the question that pops up on your screen. All right, I'll give you 10 more seconds. All right, I think we can close it out and share the results. Okay, so how frequently does your health center conduct SDOH screenings? Biggest answer was annually, followed by every visit. Then as needed, depends on the department or provider, and other, please send in the chat, which I'm seeing at new patient visits and then annually, or annually and with every transition of care. Great answers. Thanks, everyone. So there are several health IT functions that health centers can use to ensure that social needs data is being collected routinely and systematically. Electronic reminders can be used to notify staff that a patient is due for their initial social needs screening. One way to set up is to add social needs screenings to the care guidelines in the EHR. Population health management tools can also be useful. Some health centers add social needs screening to their huddle sheets or pre-visit planning tools used during morning huddles and pre-visit planning so that the care team can quickly assess which patients are due for a screening. Some health centers also use population health tools to pull reports on which patients are due for a screening at any given time to monitor the patient population as a whole. One health center noted that this approach helps them to not only assess the screening status of the patients that consistently came into the clinic, but it also helps them catch their patients that had not visited the clinic recently and needed to be re-engaged by clinic staff. In order to reach social needs screening goals, it is likely that health centers will need to use a combination of these tools. In our work with health centers around social needs, we frequently heard hesitancy about how, when, and if to ask questions about social needs because of the sensitivity of information being collected. Health center staff may feel uncomfortable or awkward when asking screening questions of patients 
because social needs are a sensitive topic. They may anticipate that patients will be embarrassed. Patients may also feel uncomfortable or judged. Discomfort around asking sensitive screening questions should not get in the way of your health center implementing a social needs screening program. There are several strategies that can help your staff to build their comfort around asking sensitive questions. One of these is role playing. In addition to sharing resources with staff, give them an opportunity to role play what conversations about screening for social needs can look like. Having a chance to practice a conversational approach in a supportive setting will build staff members' confidence to apply the approach when meeting with patients. Another strategy is sharing successes. As I mentioned earlier, it can be helpful to encourage staff champions of social needs screening or entire departments who have been leading this work to apply these approaches with their patients first and then report back to other staff who may be more hesitant. Anecdotal stories about how this made a difference is as important as data. Empathic inquiry is a third strategy, and that's a conversational approach to social needs screening. This approach encourages providers to conduct patient-centered conversations with sensitivity, compassion, and an emphasis on patient empowerment. The Oregon Primary Care Association has developed a number of tools that I'll share on the next slide. It's also important to normalize social needs screening with your patients by saying things like, we practice integrated healthcare, which means we care about the whole person. Can I ask you a few questions to get a really good picture to inform your care today? Or, we do this to make sure that we can get a really good picture of what you've got going on, so that can inform the care we provide for you today. Once your staff build comfort around collecting social needs data, they will be able to successfully engage with patients in a way that increases trust and therefore meaningful responses. Health centers have shared with us that talking with patients about their social needs has benefits beyond what they expected to see. For example, often what will happen during screening is that the patient may not have the social needs themselves, but they may voice that they have a friend or family member who does and ask for resources. Screening is also beneficial because it's simply a way for the patient to learn that their health center can be a resource for more than just medical care. Staff can let patients know that even if they don't have any social needs in the current moment, you're here to help them in the future. Conducting a screening with patients can be an opportunity to start a conversation about social needs, not just have it be one and done. So here is some resources from the OPCA um, about empathic inquiry and patient-centered conversations. I'm realizing um, that I'm not gonna have Natalie send out that chat, so I'll send a link to that in a few moments. Um, and lastly, Natalie's going to send out a link to our social needs screening star badge in the chat now. This badge contains all the resources we've chatted out during this presentation. If you review all of the resources in the badge, you'll be awarded a health center social needs screening star badge that can be added to profiles such as LinkedIn. And that is it for my presentation. I'll turn it back over to you, Joseph. Great, thank you so much, Molly. Really appreciate it. Um, making sure that I am on off mute. Great. Um, well, I really appreciate that. We're going to move into our um, health center panel portion here, where if I can get my screen to cooperate. Here we go. All right, we're going to invite Pearlie and Meredith to come off mute and join in for our Q&A portion. We're really, really lucky to have Pearlie and Meredith joining us from Atlanta um, from Mercy Care to have a little discussion about what this work looks like at their organization and some of the, the lessons that they've learned. Um, Pearlie and Meredith, would you mind just initially starting us off with an introduction and just saying hey? Yeah, um, I'm Pearlie Takafra. I'm the Chief of Care Delivery for Mercy Care. So that means I manage the clinical leadership team as well as our operations leadership team here. And hey, everyone, I'm Meredith Swartz. I'm a healthcare consultant here in Atlanta, I'm a longtime consultant to Mercy Care. Oh, when is, when is she gonna need that equipment? She don't need a, she don't need it like today. Joseph, I think you're muted. Yeah. There we go. Hear me now. Yep. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, we've got some questions that we set aside uh, to guide our conversation with 
with you all. So we're just going to jump right in um, with the first one. So what would you describe as the ultimate goal of social needs screening at your health center? Yeah, um, so ultimately our aspiration for all of our patients is to meet their goals as they've defined them, both clinically and socially. And for many of our folks, the social side really acts as a barrier to reaching their health goals. So as we work to empower our patients to solve for the social determinants and therefore be able to focus on their health, we do our best to walk alongside them in removing those barriers. And the screening is really our first opportunity to engage in a conversation with them to start to think about goal setting alongside them, and it allows us to work on a care plan together um, for how Mercy Care can best support them on their journey. Great, thank you so much. Um, and as we go through these questions, by the way, feel free to add any additional questions that you have in the chat or any thoughts that um, come up based off of your answers. So let's move into the second question, which is what social determinants of health screening tool or tools do you use at Mercy? And did you all face any challenges when deciding to use this tool? Yeah, so we use PREPARE, the protocol for responding to and assessing patients' assets, risks, and experiences. Um, we really chose this because one, it was a nationally standardized tool, and it also um, worked with our version of EPIC, which is part of the OCHIN collaborative. And how frequently do you conduct that uh, prepare screening for each patient? Um, so we conduct the screening annually for each patient. Um, we also like don't do the entire screening. Um, we are currently focused on four parts of it, like food insecurity, housing, transportation, and financial strain. And if I could um, just add to that. So how did you all decide to focus on just those four um, what was that decision like for y'all? Yeah, so um, this, so it really was looking at like the process of implementing a screening tool like this. We're doing a lot of other screenings for our behavioral health also. Um, and this is part of the rooming process that the, our medical assistants are supporting us in. So we, what we did was when we started, we started like with one part of the tool. So we were asking the food insecurity and then each um, additional year we've added like one or two pieces to it um, to augment that. Great, thank you. Um, how is social needs screening conducted and entered into the EHR? Yeah, so like I said before, um, it's conducted during our rooming process of our patients. Our medical assistants support us in this, and it's part of the flow sheet in the EPIC workflow. So it's just built into the system, and it's part of their routine. Great. Thank you, Perlene. It looks like we've got a few questions coming in the chat, so we'll have some to add on to our eight here. Um, so, did you encounter any challenges when configuring your EHR to capture social needs data? No, it, the, because we chose something that was supported by our EHR, we didn't really run into any challenges. And what efforts did you make to reduce duplication or overlap that arose through the screening process? Um, so that really is looking at all of the screenings that we're doing and making sure that we are not asking the same questions to our patients over and over again. Um, and that's just part of just the kind of care that you have to deliver to patients, right? It's to not ask them the same question, make them feel like you are listening as a care provider. Mm -hmm. And do you have any champions at Mercy Care for social needs screening? Um, and why are they champions? Yeah, we, we definitely do. The executive leadership team members are huge advocates for this work, and they use the data to help um, advocate for policy change, which is hugely important here in Georgia. I know it is everywhere. Um, but really, the most important champions are, are part of the care teams. Uh, Pearlie and I were at a morning huddle in the clinic earlier this week, and one of the reminders from the team was that it's a new year, and so every single patient is due for their screening. And, and for these folks, you know, who are taking care of patients day to day, just seeing how working on the social determinants really improves their lives, both socially and clinically, um, really helps them stay excited about that work. They get to celebrate those successes alongside their patients. So it's really a win for them as well. That's great. Thank you. 
And the final one that we have prepared before we move to the audience questions is what has moved your social determinants of health process along or strengthened it? Um, I think it has, it's really been buy-in from not only just the team that is doing the work, but really from the leadership level that this is so important for our patients to get exactly the kind of care that they need. Um, and that, that really has been, it, it's just championed at all levels of the organization. Great. Well, I see a few questions here in the chat. The first from Joshua um, that says, how do you address limited staffing capacity when using long and involved screenings like prepare, um, especially if a language interpreter is needed. Yeah, I think that it's just like how I mentioned that we start with one portion of it um, and add that to the rooming process and kind of build from there. You like Rome wasn't built in a day. You can't do all of this overnight. So one step at a time is the best way to do it. Yeah. Incremental growth with that. Um, and we have, could you speak about your organization and how it acts on the data collected? So what do you use the social determinants of health data for? Meredith, I'll let you take that. You want to go first, Perlin? No. Oh, um, so for us, so for me, the social determinants of health data, I manage the clinical team and my goal for all my clinicians is that they should only be clinicians. They are not social workers. So this information like helps me to know what do we need, what other people do we need in the clinic, what other partnerships do we need, so that we have a place to send people who have these uh, specific social determinants of health challenges. Um, so that, it, and then that reduces, you know, it addresses things like burnout in clinicians and all that other stuff that is just, that bubbles up when you're working with very complicated patients. And on the social care side, um, the, the social determinant screening can actually trigger a referral directly to a case manager. Um, so Mercy Care is really fortunate to have um, folks who can do both the sort of one touch, I need food stamps, I need access to X, and it's an easy handoff all the way to really complicated individuals who need a, a higher touch, longer term intervention on the social care side. So it really helps us to create a pathway for those patients, but also to be able to understand what the needs are within the patient population so that we can staff accordingly and fundraise accordingly. And then do you want me to take a, the question from Scott about the feedback loop for referral? Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, it's a great um, question, so Scott. Mercy Care participates in a community-wide initiative in Atlanta called the Community Resource Hub, which is which started in 2020, March of 2020 specifically. Um, so we brought together a group of service providers who are willing to collaborate and work a little bit differently. And so we created this closed network. Um, certainly we can, any social worker can refer anywhere, but we've created this uh, group of social service agencies who provide that feedback loop for us. And so we make very warm handoffs. Um, we promise our promise to the agencies is we are making good referrals to you. So um, for example, we will not, we make sure we don't send women to a men's shelter. We make sure um, we send people who are eligible to work to staffing services. Um, and then the commitment of those partners is that they they know the folks are coming, they greet them, they have as much information as we're allowed to share based on how a patient consented. So they're not having to tell their life story again. We try to be very trauma informed. And then after that visit, or if the patient doesn't make it, um, the, the service agency lets the community health worker know, and then they enter that information back into Epic. We're working on automating it. Um, but the lesson we did, it, we studied several organizations around the country, including San Diego 211, which was sort of the gold standard for that level of care. Um, and we were told you need to figure out how to work together and then layer technology on top of that. So we are exploring the, the more automated piece of that now. But that's how we handle the referral loop um, is as part of this larger network of um, both healthcare systems and community providers. 
That's great. Thank you. That was a great, great question. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more before we go into our breakout rooms. Um, I see this question. Let's see. They're changing orders here. I think this question from Scott was a clarification about that last one of do you do this through Epic? Yes, we do do it through okay. Epic and our social services um, uh, team is also utilizing Epic also. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and that just makes care better for our patients because when you come into your primary care appointment, you're assuming that everyone in the team is talking to each other. So if everything is in the EMR, including what the social services team is working on, the provider, the primary care providers can also speak to that and find out that, you know, you, they have a better understanding of where, the, what's going on in their patient's social lives and can like address their care needs as in respect to that. And I'll just answer this last follow-up question. Natalie, we have MOUs, BAAs, and very encrypted spreadsheets. Um, and we have a, a, during an assessment, during an intake, the patient has to consent to have information shared. Great, thank you all so much for um, adding questions to our conversation. This has been really great. And Pearlie and Meredith really appreciate y'all's insight and in, in sharing with us. Um, we have about 15 minutes until the top of the hour. So we're gonna spend the next, I'd say eight to 10 minutes in breakout rooms to make sure that we have an opportunity to bring up any, um, any challenges that you're facing, any successes that you all have as organizations um, in doing this work. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see what I'm doing. And we're gonna split up into four different groups that are all um, overseen by, I guess, me, Chad, Natalie, and Molly. And so I'm going to, it should automatically let us all get into four different breakout rooms. And we'll start now. As we round out our time together, just wanted to say thank you all so much. I know our our breakout room had a great conversation. Um, I wish we had a little bit more time, but I really appreciate everyone's participation in today's event. Thank you so much to our guests from Mercy Care who uh, shared their time with us this uh, afternoon and our colleagues from High Tech as well. We really appreciate everyone so much. I'm going to, as we leave, um, launch our evaluation poll, which we'd really appreciate any feedback that you all have, which helps us evaluate and um, sort of plan our sessions in the future as well. Um, but just really grateful for everyone's time. Um, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your afternoon and the rest of your week.